Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Duke Football Coverage Podcast, brought to you as always by Bull City Coordinators. You can follow us on Twitter at Duke FB Coverage. Our DMs are open, and you can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. And we are on a lot of the social medias. We're on the Reddits, the Grams, the uh, Mastodon, whatever. Uh, you know, a lot of places. Not Blue Sky or Blue Ski or however you pronounce it yet. Still waiting for that invite to come through. Although, let's be honest, none of us need more social media. But with all that out of the way, you know where to find us. You know how to get in touch with us. Let's get to our next guest. He is a returning guest of the podcast. He contributes to Streaking the Lawn and College Basketball Review. He has covered the ACC for many years now, and you probably remember him from his eponymous podcast, if I pronounced that word correctly. Dan Siegel, how are you, sir? I am good. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been, yeah, been since last offseason, I guess, since I was on this show, but excited to hop back on. And, man, I'm just counting down the weeks, basically, till college football season starts because – when it comes to college sports in the summer, there's baseball. Obviously, as you mentioned, I'm a UVA guy, so that's over for me. And it's just it's just a long time. So I'm counting down the weeks and getting ready basically for football season to start in late August. All right. Well, we're going to get into that in a minute, and we're going to get into what you've been up to since about the last year it's been since, it, that, since you've been on here. But I did say on Twitter that I had to tell a story about my children and Father's Day, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, run it back here. Go back to Mother's Day. I got up in the morning, and our, our rule on Mother's Day is mom doesn't have to cook anything. Okay, so I asked the kids, "What do you want for breakfast?" I'm gonna go get some biscuits from somewhere, and they say we want mom's breakfast. And I look at them because I just gotten up, and I said, "What did you come to some agreement with mom? What's going on?" And they've all been up for a little bit. They get up at like 5.30. It's crazy, regardless of whether it's a weekend. And and my wife says they don't realize it's Mother's Day, which, uh, yeah, you can't. That's the ultimate sin. You have to know it's Mother's Day. So immediately they spring into gear and, and all that. So the wife and I decide, let's see what happens on Father's Day. Okay, let's, let's see how long we can get them to go if they remember it. So I come downstairs on Father's Day. And I say to my daughter, hey, do you want to watch... Uh, a show with me and she says no i'm watching this i want to watch this okay so go in uh read like i normally do and my wife starts making breakfast and we call the kids in and as soon as my son gets upstairs he immediately snaps into father's day mode and says happy father's day dad and then my daughter's like oh it's father's day and we're shocked because my wife and I, we're, we're in our head. We're saying, how did the boy remember this? Usually it's the girl. Like, she's the decorator. She's got all the gifts. She makes cards. How did he remember this? I said, son, how did you know it was Father's Day? And he said, well, I noticed mom was making blueberry pancakes, and she never makes that. So I figured it had to be Father's Day. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, how his brain works like like it's some kind of flashcards or some hamster like running on a wheel trying to figure out this pattern and he ties it back to food and that's how he realizes it's realizes it's father's day so um it's okay to forget father's day but you can't forget mother's day that's no. the problem yeah, yeah absolutely my when i was growing up my parents would like the opposite parent would always like remind me like a week before or something so i always had that on my side so like if it was mother's day my dad would always be like a week before you know make sure you like let's point out like what we're gonna get mom and you know make sure you make a card all that stuff and then vice versa for father's day but yeah you i guess you put it on your own kids well normally the girl remembers mm -hmm. she always she loves yeah. decorating she loves gifts she always is on top of that and so i was really surprised that neither of them remembered Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was not surprised my son didn't remember, but I was surprised you know, she didn't remember. So just on Father's Day and, and my wife and I, we don't make a big deal out of any of those days. So we just wanted to see for our entertainment what would happen on Father's Day. Yeah. So. It was just me and my brother growing up. So 
I guess that kind of checks out for us. All right. Well, with those stories out of the way, I'd like to have you catch the audience up on what you've been doing since you were last on. Tell us a little bit about Streaking the Lawn and College Basketball Review and what you're doing for them. Yeah, so those are now the two sites that I'm writing for. I've completely moved past the days of the infamous ACC content page, which I had a lot of fun with, but unfortunately, I just got locked out of that page and had to move on. And basically, I've also at the same time been busy with a lot of, you know, I'm in college now and have a lot of stuff academic related and just like socially related. So there's been a lot of obligations there, but still I've been keeping up with my content creation. Streaking the Lawn is a UVA site where we have our own uh, blog, website, podcast, all that. And then College Basketball Review is the same thing. I I actually run the um, podcast section with, or one of the podcast sections, there's three different podcasts. We're the main one and we're on YouTube and Spotify, Apple, all that. We're called CBB Review Studio. So we do all the analysis, all our like takes on things. And I do that with a co-host and then also contribute to the writing articles where most of us have a conference that we kind of contribute to. I used to be the Atlantic 10 because that made sense for my, school UMass and the ACC already had like two other writers problem is the A-10 is just so bad nowadays so I kind of just you know chip in when wherever they need and mix and match but that's what I've been up to the last year well at least the A-10 is still around and we I don't think we have to worry about it disappearing so there is that (laughs) I guess right I mean yeah you got to look for the positive there. And I'm trying to remember. Okay, never mind. For some reason, I couldn't remember when I was in college at College Charleston, They the Cougars were in the Big South and now they're in the CAA. And I always get that confused in my mind with the A-10. So I was saying to myself, is that where the Cougars are now? But no, it's not. So, uh, all right. So that's keeping you pretty busy. You're up at UMass. Uh, you got a lot going on with that. But of course, you're as you said, you're a UVA guy. So what we're going to do now is go through the old Atlantic division yeah. and break that down and give everybody an idea of what to expect from those teams. So before we get into that, I'd like to ask you any thoughts, comments on getting rid of the divisions and changing the scheduling model? Oh, I love it. I loved it from the start. I think Okay, we're we're both fans of teams from the coastal, so we definitely got to benefit from that. But just from a unbiased, like holistic perspective of the conference, I think that was a rare good thing that the commissioner and the people in charge made. And I think it's going to truly reward the two best teams in the conference. I also I think the scheduling structure is as good as it's gonna get because you play three teams every year that you are you know geographically close with your rivals etc and then you get to play every team at least 50 percent or every other team 50 percent of the years so the schedules get more interesting it was like when you were tied a coastal and atlantic opponent together you would play just one unique conference opponent every year and it kind of got repetitive so in both in the way that it's more fair and the way that the, the schedules get a little bit more dynamic. Um, I'm a fan of the move. The only thing, and, and this came up in my mind recently that I'd like to see some tweaking on, and I'm not sure if it can be done. Maybe the conference has to expand or generally continue to exist. Right. Uh, which we can talk about later yeah. is it'd be nice if all the North Carolina schools could play each other. Because I think it's going to be NC State and Wake are not going to play each other for a while, Uh, which as Duke fans, we saw that. And we can talk about that with NC State. It's been almost 10 years since these guys played last, I think. And that's unfortunate because a lot of those games were good. A lot of them went back and forth. A lot of them were nail biters. And it was a natural rivalry and help with attendance. So I, I, I agree with you. I, I like the three five five. It's it's closer to going back to what I grew up with, which was the small regional conferences, which we'll never see again, I guess. But and and then you knew exactly how good everybody was because everybody played each other. But 
it is better, I think, than seeing teams benefit from playing maybe not great competition every year. And you're really testing yourself against the rest of the conference. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I Is it like logistically possible for the four teams in North Carolina to play each other every year? Like who's Wake going to be playing instead? Let's see who Wake has. Wake has Duke, Georgia Tech, and Virginia Tech as their permanent three. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there's like some sort of like mathematical issue of playing the like just you the North Carolina schools, their three is the other three North Carolina schools. I think that would make the most sense. Yeah, because the Wolfpack has Duke. Uh, excuse me, North Carolina has Duke, NC State, and Virginia, and the Wolfpack have Clemson. Yeah. Duke in North Carolina. That's oof. UVA UNC is like, you know, it's the South's oldest rivalry. So I, I guess you, you do kind of got to preserve that, but uh, you, you got to take some sort of sacrifice with the t- decisions you make. I don't think that decision is perfect, but I think it's the best possible. I think it, it made the most sense. And we're seeing periodically all the conferences get rid of divisions. Now you even look at the SEC and the West and the East are so lopsided. So I think the Big Ten just got rid of division or Big Ten's going to, right? Yeah, let's bring back the leaders and legends for one more year. Yeah. Such a dumb name. God, I mean, just terrible. Um, hasn't, hasn't had it. So, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm excited about it and we'll see how it plays out. And at least the ACC is willing to make some changes. But I, I think – now that we've got that general point of view out of the way, we can come back to the ACC specifically next. But why don't we go through the teams alphabetic? Well, uh, why don't we go through the teams kind of general standing order over the last yeah. couple of years, how they've been and how they how they've done, and let's just get an idea of what you think each team will do. Starting with the uh, team that's at the top of the old Atlantic every year, it seems like Clemson. What what should we expect from them? Yeah, so Clemson, there's a perception around the country that people have kind of thought they're going down a little bit and not performing up to their expectations that they have every single year. And that's, I feel like that's kind of unfair, but to a certain extent, it's true. They haven't made the playoffs in a couple of years. They haven't won a national championship in a few more, so... I, I think there's truth to that, but I don't possibly see this Clemson team winning any less than 10 games. I think every time we doubt them, they prove that the stability in their program, for the most part at least, has been able to keep them at double-digit plus wins every single year. I do worry about the modern climate of college football and college sports in general. And that is the transfer portal and how Dabo Sweeney has not really used it as much as the fellow top programs in the country. And that might be why Clemson has fallen from that one to three range in the country to more of that, like four to seven range. But I do think that the addition of Garrett Riley an offensive coordinator and his Dabo Sweeney's ability to make that difficult decision, which to to most of us, it seems like a very easy decision, but for Dabo to go against the grain and hire from outside, it was difficult for him. And Garrett Riley has a really good background. He did incredible things at TCU. He's done incredible things his entire career as an offensive coordinator. And I think the team of him and the quarterback, Cade Klubnick, will really do well. I genuinely don't think they are as talented, though, as Florida State, which I I would presume that will be the next team we talk about. You you did your research. (laughs) Yeah, but I genuinely think that it's it's very difficult to project them to lose, like, any more than one to two games. I think that's right, and I just want to read off the schedule here. And what I did was I I believe uh, the t- way we're going to go through this is I pulled up the rankings from the Atlantic for last season. So we'll go through it that way. But And I'm not asking you for a win-loss record or for each game, a win-loss projection for each, each game. But I, I think when I went through it last night, I had the same thought about 10 wins. Duke, which I would love for the Blue Devils to beat them. I 
don't think that's going to happen. And one thing I would say is Clemson is historically defensive line you, and it's going to be a real interesting matchup for the blue devils who have a very old offensive line, especially for the blue devils. They've got talent on the, the defensive line, uh, Dwayne Carter, Jamie on Franklin. They've got guys there, but going up against the talent offensively at the other positions could be very hard uh, for, for the blue devils. So I think you've got to, Say Clemson's going to win that game. Then they've got Charleston, Southern, Florida, Atlantic. The next three is interesting. Florida State, Syracuse, and Wake. You're thinking probably, what, two and one out of that, right? Yeah. And then they've got a bye week. Then Miami, NC State, Notre Dame. And you're thinking they're probably, worst case scenario, two and one. Yeah. And then they close it out, Georgia Tech, North Carolina, and South Carolina. I think they probably sweep those last three, don't you? Yeah, I mean, they, like they could slip up, but Clemson. I mean, they they did lose to South Carolina last year, to be fair. But I think seven times out of ten they win that game. So yeah, there were some questionable play calls towards yeah. the end of that. I mean, I no, not taken away from South Carolina because they did everything right to be in that position. But yeah, anyway, I think Clemson, right. Florida, Clemson versus Florida State will be that like deciding game. The only problem is presumably they will play each other again in the ACC championship. And the problem, that's another problem, I guess, with getting rid of divisions is it kind of loses the thrill of that one regular season matchup. Similar to like in the Big Ten, even a bigger example, Ohio State and Michigan. They play each other the last week of the season. That used to be like the the biggest game. Everybody's eyes are on that game. Well, they're rematching each other in the Big Ten championship. It kind of loses it a little bit. So. I think you've got a point there. That that that's a good point, and uh, maybe you can schedule around some of those issues, and it's not as much of a problem at the ACC if you make your out of conference rival maybe the last one. But you know, we'll see. Hard to know. So let's turn to my law partners team, the Seminoles. All mm-hmm. right, give us your thoughts on the Knolls. They actually, I believe, are the odds favorite to win the ACC, and I kind of agree with that. It starts with Jordan Travis, the quarterback, who has progressed every single year and now could be considered a Heisman contender. He's just a really dynamic player in terms of what he could do with his arm, what he could do with his legs. He's gotten so much better at picking apart defenses and being able to take what the coverage gives him. And that is something he struggled with early on in his career. So that's definitely going to be a big storyline The transfer portal strategy has been big for what has gotten Florida State to a team that was not even going bowling every year to now, um, uh, I I mean, maybe this is too far, but potentially, uh, at least based on what the preview magazines are saying, a college football playoff contender. And it's because Mike Norvell has, their, their head coach has not emphasized getting these freshman but instead just filling the needs every year in the transfer portal just getting like positional needs and loading up on talent that has already been experienced has already established themselves and it helps that one of them is that wide receiver Keon Coleman from Michigan State they got Johnny Wilson returning also at wide receiver Trey Benson I mean their offense is just loaded they no longer have those real offensive line issues that used to be very prevalent with Florida State. They got Fentrell Cypress from UVA in the transfer portal. He's one of the top cornerbacks. They, Jared Verse is returning. He might be my projected ACC um, defensive player of the year favorite and could win, could potentially be an All-American. So Florida State is loaded with talent. Mike Norvell has never been in a position yet where – Florida State has started the season projected as one of the better teams in the country. So that's a test that he will have to face. But talent-wise, I think that's the best team in the ACC. I think they look good. And having watched a lot of games uh, last year, having watched the Knowles a lot, they played like a reflection of their coach. He seemed to have it together on the sidelines. He seemed to not let the moment get too big for him and his team – and particularly his quarterback seemed to play the same way. Let's go through their schedule. LSU could be a challenge to start the season. 
but they're but the Knolls are going to feel confident because they beat them last year. So you got LSU, Southern Miss, Boston College, Clemson. Worst case scenario, you start two and two. Then you got Virginia Tech, Syracuse, Duke, Wake Forest, Pitt, Miami, North Alabama, and Florida. That back end of that schedule, I think the team that you probably have to worry about the most is going to be Pitt because Pitt's always deadly. They can always beat anybody on any given day. Somehow, some way, they they can. But I think right now you got to feel good if you're Florida State going up against the Hurricanes and the and the Gators, don't you? Absolutely. I think Florida definitely has a lot of issues and they'll have a lot to prove this year. Miami, for whatever reason, everyone's projecting them to all of a sudden turn it around. And they there's there's reasons to believe that, but to just assume that and have the win total at like eight and a half or whatever it is, I think that's a little steep. So I think they, they should win both of those games. But it's rivalry, so rivalries always make the point spread closer to zero. Miami is the all preseason team. Yeah. Until we see something different. All right. Now let's look at an interesting team that I don't think anybody should sleep on, but that nobody's really sure what to expect from them, and that is Louisville. What do you think about the cards? This is going to be an interesting team to follow this year because – Obviously, the the first storyline is their new head coach, Jeff Brom. I think that's definitely an upgrade over Scott Satterfield. Jeff Brom came over from Purdue. Can he win in his first year? That's the question. A lot of people think that he's going to be an eight at worst seven win program in his first year. I think it's difficult to just step right into a football program and have all this roster turnover. Granted, their roster turnover has, if anything, made them better and not worse, but still I think it's difficult to step in, establish your culture with all this roster turnover and win that much in one off season to, to a season. But also you got to consider that their quarterback, Jack Plummer, who came over from Cal, he's experienced, but it's not like he was putting up got ungodly numbers out there. So I'm a little bit skeptical in Louisville. I view this as more of a six to seven win team. I think in the long-term future, they made the right hire. I like a couple of their transfers that they got from the state of Georgia. Their cornerback, Marcus Washington, came from UGA. And then wide receiver, um, Jamari Thrash, I think is his name, from Georgia State. He had over 1,100 yards last season. So the roster is good enough to be that third team in the Atlantic. The question is, or I guess what would be the Atlantic? The question is, you know, there, there's a lot of roster turnover. I think there's definitely some roadblocks that could occur on their way. And, and let's keep in mind about uh, Jeff Brom is he was 36 and 34 at Purdue, 26 and 25 in conference. Purdue is not the easiest place to win at. Correct. So maybe it's not the first year, but maybe it's the second or third year. And you know the guy can coach. Absolutely. And you know he has ties to Louisville, and he's got ties to that recruiting area. That's a team I'd rather play early than late. Totally agree. Totally agree. All right, and let's go through their schedule real quick. Uh, They're playing Georgia Tech to start. That could be a good game. Then they've got Murray State. Then they got Indiana, Boston College, NC State, Notre Dame, Pitt. That is a brutal three-game stretch. Jeez. Then they've got Duke, Virginia Tech, and Virginia. I think you probably are favoring the Blue Devils in that game, at least right now. And I think you probably, depending on how, how the cards do, you favor them against the Cavs. Then they close out against Miami and Kentucky. So, you know... I would not be surprised if they're hovering around five wins. Does that sound about right to you? I said six, but six to seven. But thinking now about that schedule, I could revise that to five to six. I think I, I don't. I think a range of five to seven for them makes sense because if they yeah. catch fire late, they could end up pushing it. Maybe finish six and six, and then win a bowl game, or maybe finish seven and five. I'd say they're definitely one of the more high variance teams in the conference. They're hard to get a feel for. I'd say them and 
Miami because that's pretty much the case every year. The two of the more high variance teams in the conference, it's hard to project them in the preseason. And the good thing is they have a coach who's not always going to be putting his resume together. So uh, that should help some, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now we turn to a very interesting team, or at least I think it's a very interesting team. NC State. What do you think about the Wolfpack? Yeah, so I actually happened to – I mean, I've, I've watched their entire offensive coordinator quarterback tandem for – multiple years at Virginia and it's it's super interesting so for those of you that don't know they brought in as a transfer Brendan Armstrong the quarterback from Virginia Brendan Armstrong in 2021 was phenomenal Brendan Armstrong in 2022 was awful and the one difference you could say he had was in 2021 he had his offensive coordinator that recruited him and that is Robert and I and then in 2022 he did not have quite the same offensive staff. And that could be part of the reason he fell off, but he fell off a lot. And obviously now in 2023, Robert and I is back the offensive coordinator at NC state. So can he return to 2021 production? Maybe, but it's, it's, it's a super interesting case because one of those seasons, perhaps both of those seasons, 2021 and 2022 were just like, statistical outliers and i think if we're projecting 2023 it's he's got to be somewhere in between but that is a large range of in between for brennan armstrong the good thing about nc state is that if armstrong struggles early they also have mj morris who had a couple of good games last year so i'm excited for the young man there i think this should definitely be whenever dave dorian is coaching a team they definitely have a high floor I don't see them having a disastrous season falling short of six wins, especially with the defense that should be pretty top tier. Peyton Wilson is back for the gazillionth year and they have Aiden white and Shaheem battle, which is as good of a one, two cornerback duo as you'll get. So we don't know about the quarterback situation, but I, I project them before really diving into their schedule around like a, a seven, seven and five team. Oh, I'm going to veer off a little bit and not go in order of what I wanted to talk about because what you'd said about Armstrong is making me think about what I wanted to ask you about later, but I'll go ahead and ask it now because I think thematically it fits, which is going and getting a guy like Armstrong, yeah. getting getting the offensive coordinator that you got. This is one of the things with the portal. It's a lot like when the Clippers got Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. and they don't win the championship, right? And then Doc Rivers is gone. This kind of feels like you're putting all your chips on the table and you're going to win now. And how does the administration and how do the fans feel if the Wolfpack only goes seven and five this season? I think the administrate, or I'm, I can't speak for the administration, but I know the fan base. I'm, I'm pretty in tune with that. And I know they are, most of them are pretty upset about not going with MJ Morris. I think they like the Robert and I hire, but the problem of putting all the eggs in Brennan Armstrong's basket, they, they saw him a lot last year. He was not good at all. He had more interceptions than passing touchdowns and they saw MJ Morris. And, you know, as a fan, you have a young quarterback that plays a couple of really good games. You're naturally going to get really excited about it. Is it rational? To a certain extent, yes, not completely, but yeah, I, I'm. I think the fan base is kind of skeptical. Skeptical to put it nicely on Armstrong and NC State's tired of going seven and five, eight and four, seven and five, eight and four, six and six. Like they, they want something bigger and better than that. And I honestly, Brennan Armstrong gives them a lot of upside, but it's a risk you're taking. Here, here's the other thing too, is let's just assume it doesn't go well after the way, and I'm not saying that it will go well. I think state has some upside. They have a good defense. They have talent. They've shown they can win games, 
But especially the way the season ended last season for the Wolfpack with that thing that you called football because it met the strictest dictionary sense of the word as football, which was the Duke's Mayo Bowl. I I can just see fans finally saying this is enough because, again, it, you're gambling. You're putting all your eggs in the Brennan Armstrong basket, it seems like. It's a big free agent almost move. Doesn't work out, you know, that that could cause some problems. No, for sure. And the fans, I mean, MJ Morris is like exciting and, and young, but also if you assume, which I'm not sure this is an assumption you can make, but if you assume that the coaching staff handles the situation the right way in terms of the two quarterbacks, having a second capable quarterback cannot hurt you. The problem is people just think they're going to be too relying on Brendan Armstrong, giving too much of a margin of error and not, not punish him, not, not hold him accountable for struggling. It'll be interesting to watch, see how it unfolds, particularly if Armstrong struggles early and let's go through the start of the schedule. You've got UConn, Notre Dame, VMI, Lexington, man, great place. Go visit. Then you got the Cavs. Then you got the Cards. Then you got Marshall. Then you got Duke, bye week, Clemson, Miami, Wake Forest, Virginia Tech, and North Carolina. The Here are the games that are obvious problems for NC State. I, I think we could agree on this. Notre Dame, right? Yeah. Uh, Clemson. Yeah, you can never say no to that. And then Wake could be, but it's not a definite that it will be. Wake is later on the season, you said, so we'll have a lot better of a grasp for who they are. And same thing with Virginia Tech, who started playing a lot better towards the end of last season. Now, yeah. I think they've still got a lot to work through, but at the end of the season, that could be tough. And North Carolina and NC State has a lot of sizzle, as Joe Ovia says. So looking at that schedule, they've got they should be able to beat UConn, VMI, should be able to beat UVA, should be able to beat Louisville, should be able to beat Marshall. That's one, two, three, four, five. We'll see what happens against Duke. I'll be at that game, so I'm not going to pick it. I don't want to jinx anything. Hmm. State ought to be able to beat Miami. That's six. And then between Wake and Virginia Tech, they could go – two and oh or they could go one and one but that's seven or eight wins and then north carolina is anybody's guess yeah so that's basically what they've been every year and some people are happy to be relevant every year in the conference some people want to be more nationally relevant and it's that that's the nc state fan base right there you know they're they're an interesting group because they always think they should win 10 games while simultaneously believing they will lose every game they play. Yeah. I I think a lot of the NC state fan base, they, you know, their hatred towards North Carolina in, in football is like no other, but they, they just, sometimes they play into the narrative a little bit and just being everybody being against them the NCAA and the, you know, the narrative and the media and all that. And it, it, it's, it's bothersome sometimes, but they're also very passionate and a lot of them are cool. So. But know. shouldn't, shouldn't we all come together and hate North Carolina? I could agree to that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's get your thoughts on the orange. What can we expect from Syracuse this season? Well, First off, another uh, close relation, I guess, to the Virginia football program because Jason Beck will be the new offensive coordinator for Syracuse. I think this is a long overdue move for Jason Beck to get an OC job. He's His work with quarterbacks has been phenomenal, and I, I have full faith in him to run a good offense right away. I think Garrett Schrader, their quarterback, and his fall off last year from when they started – six and oh to when they ended up finishing one and five i think that was kind of overblown out of proportion i still think he's a good quarterback 
Syracuse did build something last year and they're losing some key pieces, especially Sean Tucker. That's going to be huge, but I don't think, I, I think last year Syracuse did build something more than what they've had the la- the previous like three, four seasons. So I'm confident that this team could go bowling and I should go bowling. I would even I would even be inclined to say. Sean Tucker believes that Syracuse should go bowling too. Now let's go through their schedule because I do think you mentioned the one and five collapse down the stretch. I do think there's going to be some pressure on Dino Babers. We can come back to that later when we talk about it now, whichever you prefer. But first, I I do want to get into their schedule. Colgate, Western Michigan, Purdue. I don't know what to expect from Purdue uh, this season. Then you've got Army, which is not a bad team. Clemson, North Carolina, Florida State, bye week, Virginia Tech, Boston College, Pitt, they're playing in the Bronx. Okay. Georgia Tech and Wake Forest. So looking at that schedule, they've got a shot. I think that three-game stretch against Clemson, North Carolina, and Florida State, the scheduling gods must just really hate Syracuse there because that's rough. Yeah. Uh, It it could be like similar to last year, I guess. I don't know. Syracuse is tough because – like I said, they built something, but everybody was saying after their six and zero start, it was fluky. It was fluky. They 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 wouldn't do that ten times over if the season was replayed. But and then they got proved right, or I guess their narrative got proved right. I don't know if that's necessarily that. I don't know if that's necessarily something you could say, but. Well, here's one thing I noticed, too. It's actually a four-game stretch that's brutal because you play Army, and they run that triple option still yeah. if memory serves. And then, then you turn around and play the Tigers, and then you've got North Carolina and Florida State. I mean uh, – I- Army at the beginning of that, like, they'll bang you up. Even if you come out with a win, like, you'll be – that's a team you you would ideally have a bye week after because there's a, the way they, like, block and the, their – schemes it's like a little bit. it's like the old you know, Seinfeld who is the guy that scheduled this for the orange I mean that is that's going to be rough and looking at Army's last couple of seasons let's go back starting in 2019 five and eight nine and three nine and four six and six two bowl games that's not bad uh and they 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 know what they're doing and they're going to play good football. So that is, that could be a rough one. I think a success for successful season for Syracuse would be six wins and going to a bowl game, right? Yeah. Successful. Not is it, you're not feeling like you're on top of the world, but knowing who you are, you can't complain. I think that's, that's a very fair and accurate description there. Let's turn the page and get to the Demon Deacons of Wake Forest. Tell us what your thoughts are on those guys. Yeah, so a lot of people have doubt in Mitch Griffiths, who's going to be their new quarterback. I, I'm i not sure how to feel about him. I mean, none of us are because we haven't really seen him too much in action. But I have faith in that system and Warren Ruggiero, who's their offensive coordinator, and that – system that he's had has just been successful year after year I think similarly we'll see Sam Hartman at Notre Dame his numbers will decline a little bit because he's playing in a less favorable system for a quarterback the concern with Wake Forest and this has been the same case year after year after year is their defense and can they stop the run they've had running backs go for several hundred yards against them Their secondary has not been great. The one thing they have been good with has been takeaways and turning you over, but their yardage numbers really, really bad year after year. So that's been what's holding Wake back as good as their offense continues to be. And I don't think they take too far of a step back this year. We're going to see some high scoring games, basically what I'm saying as, as we're accustomed to with Wake Forest. Well, let's go through what we can 
expect from them by looking at their schedule and get a sense of what's going on. It looks to me like a fairly favorable schedule, even though it has Vanderbilt on it, which was five and seven, which went five and seven last year. But Wake opens against Elon. I think that we could agree that should be a win, right? Then you've got Vanderbilt, I think also a win. Old Dominion, now anything can happen. You, Wake, right. Wake is a program that doesn't seem to lose those terrible games. I'm trying to remember if Old Dominion is in the 757. Yes, it is. It's in Norfolk, so I've got to give a shout-out uh, to my yeah. buddy Trey from law school. Got to give a shout-out to the folks from the 757 there. But you've got Elon Vanderbilt, Old Dominion, Georgia Tech. Those are your first four. There is a chance for Wake to start four and four or three and one, right? Yeah, I'd say four and oh is probably what you're going to want. And probably the most likely result, honestly. Then we've got a bye week followed by Clemson, Virginia Tech, and Pitt. Not a great three game stretch, but not the worst because yeah. you get Vir- Virginia Tech between Clemson and Pitt. And again, I, as a Blue Devil guy, I cannot say anything negative about Pitt. They own us. They're just the football gods will not allow us to beat that team. I'm excited for for Wake against Pitt too because I think that'll be the first time they'll play each other since that 2021 ACC championship. And I'm looking forward to that one too. This this could be a really good game. Then you got Florida State. Then you've got Duke, which could be a good game. And I think Duke's probably going to be favored in that one. Then you've got NC State. Then you got Notre Dame and Syracuse. So the back part of the schedule is tough. This is not a great schedule. I feel like that's every year with Wake. You know, the first four, really favorable. But after that, you're going to have to pick up a win against Virginia Tech. And you're going to have to beat NC State or Pitt. And Syracuse, I think they win that game most likely. In Cuse? Uh Yes, it's it. It's okay, at Syracuse. Yeah. yeah. So Wake's on the road for that one. They're at home against Duke, which should help them. But I still think you've got to give Duke the edge. And I think you know, Duke's got a much older team, and that's the chance historic. That those are the times historically when Duke does well. So looking at the back eight, they're going to have to scrape out a win against Virginia Tech, Syracuse, and then probably get one more from Pitt or NC State, I think. I I don't see them beating Notre Dame, but crazy things could happen. Yeah, no, the Sam Hartman Bowl, too. That would be cool. Exactly, exactly. So so what what do you think for Wake? Are they hovering around five to seven wins? Yeah, it, it, I, I know I keep saying that same answer. I think I've said that for NC State, Louisville, Syracuse, and Wake, but that's the reality of that portion of the ACC. And I think that's an accurate take. Certainly this early in the, se- the season, well, we haven't even started it yet before we really know about who's going to start, what the depth chart is and all that. All right, let's close this out, and I'm not going to include Notre Dame because I don't really consider them part of the conference, and I think including Notre Dame, uh, whenever it was that they became sort of scheduling buddies with us, scheduling BFFs, whatever, I think it has been slowly ruining the conference, but I will not engage in a TED Talk about that now. So let's go to the Eagles. I saw them play last year at Virginia Tech because you never miss an opportunity to go watch a home game at Virginia Tech if you get a chance. And boy, did BC look really bad. Should we expect anything different this season? Mm, No. (laughs) You pause for a second, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, Dan's going to go. Nope, he's not going out on a limb. He is not. Uh, I... Here's the thing about BC, you know, Emmett Moorhead is going to be their quarterback. He definitely, interestingly enough, played better last year than Phil Dracovic, who will be over at Pitt now. But Phil Dracovic has, you know, is more favorable system for him. But mm-hmm. the thing about BC, not a lot of exciting storylines around them, but look at their non-conference schedule. If they don't get to six wins, Jeff Halfley, which I think is very possible they don't get to six wins, but if they don't get to six wins with a non-conference schedule of Holy Cross, 
NIU, UConn, and Army, which I didn't even realize was legal. I thought you had to play a power five. They don't get to six wins. Halfway needs to be canned on the spot. I think you're foreseeing maybe one of the next questions that I'm going to ask you, which we will get into in a minute. I I do want to dig in real quick on Northern Illinois. uh, Because historically, they have not been a terrible program of late. They've had some bowl appearances, but they were three and nine last year. So, you know. Worried about Holy Cross, actually. One of the top FCS programs. They're just so well coached. I could totally see BC losing that game. They were 12 and one last year, six they and beat, they beat they beat Buffalo, F, FBS opponent. Yeah. And let's look at their head coach's overall record. Uh, at Holy Cross, 37 and 17. Wow. Yeah. So five and six first year, seven and six second year, three and one. That was a COVID year, uh, 2020. Then 10 and three, 12 and one, and has been ranked. Uh, every year uh, in the FCS since 2020. Now, I mean, 2020, you can't, it's hard to really count that too much, but look at his conference record, 23 and three. <laughs> what What if Holy Cross like runs the table or something, Go like goes to an FCS championship, in the process beats BC, halfway gets fired, and now all of a sudden, I forgot their coach's name, but he's in the running for the BC job. Yeah, I don't know if Bob Chesney would take that job. Maybe he would. I, I don't know. It's I mean, not. He's long overdue for an FCS, FBS, I should say, position. And there's a reason he's sticking around. So I don't know. Everybody at Holy Cross is telling you to to quiet down right now. Um, <laughs> they're all saying, hey, 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 hey. They're 30, they're like 20, 30 minutes from my uh, campus at UMass. And I said, if they host a playoff game this year, I'm absolutely going to go and see what the atmosphere is like. Oh, absolutely. You should. I mean, but let's look at, okay, so let's, let's go through the Eagles. Cause I don't think Halfley makes it through this season. I think they beat Northern Illinois. They may not beat Holy Cross. They're not going to beat Florida state Louisville. They could potentially squeak by just cause we don't know. Right. Yeah, early, early, better than early than late. You said. Yeah, UVA. I mean, I, I don't know what to expect from the I'll Cavs. That, that game that will be not entertaining, but yeah, <laughs> Army. I think Army beats Boston College, don't you? Yeah, although our Army is vulnerable. I think Army. I talk about like a lot of high variance teams, and Army's like one of those because they limit the possession so much. They're more they're prone to upset and also prone to beating somebody better. Right. It's like Virginia basketball. It's like when you're limiting the possessions of the game, like more fluky things could happen. Especially when they don't call fouls against and call fouls on flip, but we won't go into that now. So, but BC at least gets a bye week after playing Army. Then they go to Georgia Tech. I think Georgia Tech probably has the edge in that game. And then UConn, who I think plays every ACC team this year. Then you've got Syracuse, Virginia Tech. I think Virginia Tech wins that one. I think Pitt wins. Miami probably wins. So let's go through kind of where, if you're Boston College, you get your wins. You get maybe one against Northern Illinois. Maybe another one against Louisville. Maybe another one against Virginia. And then UConn, that's four. And maybe you pick they off. Lost. They, isn't that at UConn too? It it no, it's home. It's oh, home. because they lost to UConn last year. Yeah, it was like three nothing or like ten three or something like that. Yeah, so I mean, do, do you see them doing much better than than three and nine, four and eight? No, I. They could reach six. Like they'll be favored against Holy Cross, NIU, UConn, and potentially Army, but they won't be favored by more than a couple points. Wow, the Huskies beat them thirteen to three. Yeah, that was that was really bad. That was really bad. Whew. Okay. Well, mm, mm. all and right. They won Zay Flowers this year, and Zay Flowers is incredible. So, so not looking good for the Eagles. They are not soaring. No. Okay. So, a couple other things I wanted to ask you about: teams with the most pre, uh, which team has the most pressure? 
this season? I'm Boston College, absolutely, because I think Halfley, like you said, might not even make it through the season. I'd say other than that, Clemson definitely has some pressure because a lot of the national media has kind of been putting them down a little bit, but also Clemson is a program that fuels that is fueled on doubt. So I feel like every time you doubt them, they'll be better. And when they're on the top of the world, Dabo Sweeney still tries to preach that everybody's doubting us narrative. And then it's people don't really buy into it as much. So that's my take on Clemson. But in terms of like the coaches and whether they'll make it through the season or not, it's probably Boston college and NC State will be an interesting one because we're not sure with Dave Dorian what exactly the 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 athletic department thinks of him. So if they are sick and tired like the fan base of constantly being like above average but nothing more, then maybe he has to step up this year. Or maybe the administration is fine with that. I'm not sure. So that will be my three right there. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I think that that you were accurate in who the teams and coaches are. You anticipated one of my questions. I think NC State, I think Dave Doran has a lot of pressure on him. Uh, and I think BC has some pressure. Dino Babers, although the administration, from what I understand, they seem to like him. So as long as there's not a huge collapse, I think he could be okay. But you, you never know. I mean, if they're disastrous, they might go ahead and make a change although he's had some good seasons there. Now, uh, one other thing I want to ask you about is, let's talk about the big picture of the conference. Is it going to be around? We heard some crazy rumors from, and I'll just say this, if you want to know what's going on with ACC, don't necessarily look to the national figureheads. Look to your local reporters. Those are the guys who are in the know. Listen to the OG podcast. They'll talk to you about it. We heard some crazy stuff coming out of the ACC meeting that happened, but what are you thinking about what we could expect from the conference going forward? Well, I don't know if I could necessarily have, like give you some sort of inside scoop or like good perspective on what's going to happen. I could tell you. This is all just vibes, vibes and feelings. Uh, this is yeah. all this one's about. I, yeah. I'm not an insider, you know, I, but I like. I could tell you, you my opinion. Yeah, you follow it. You follow it closely. You follow it religiously. So your opinion is more informed than a lot of people's opinion would be. So just throw it at us. Yeah. So first off, I think while things get overblown based off of quotes out of context, the leadership at the top of the conference has been at best suspect and at worst really, really poor. So that doesn't really leave me optimistic for the future. This is kind of, in a, in a way, it's unprecedented, right? Like the way the the conferences are forming into super conferences and whatnot, but also in a way, and people have brought this up, like, there's been conference realignment since the beginning of conferences and it's gone on just to the extent that it's going on. I'm not sure, but man, the I'm, I'm not a fan of it as a fan of UVA. If they could sneak into the big 10 or the sec, that would probably be like good for them. Maybe. But the problem is we, as fans, we've been fooled into, thinking that, oh, we, like the conferences expand and all these schools are getting more money. And if our school is included, that's great. You're not seeing a penny of that. All that's resulting in you as a fan, what do we care about? We care about wins and losses and rivalries. And the rivalries are going to not be there as much because there's not regional scheduling. And if you're like Oklahoma now getting added to the SEC or UCLA being added to the Big 10, like all that means the fans are getting more money. Like the administration is, they're just going to see more losses in the schedule. I think, I think you're right. And I think the, here, here is the problem is the, not to, to 
beat a dead horse, but I'm I'm going to do that. The ACC needs to tell Notre Dame to, sorry to be blunt, I'll put the explicit label on this, but to shit or get off the pot, you either join us or you're out. And I'm fine if they leave and let's go get two other teams and get to 16, find other markets. There's, I'm sure, some schools in Texas that we could add as a conference. Now you're really stretching the Atlantic brand of the name at that point. We've done it already, though. So we could be doing some things. I don't see us doing them. And I think it's because our commissioner is more concerned with sending out memos telling people not to complain about the officials. Now, again, I am not an insider. I don't talk to the commissioner's office and I don't care to, but there, so let me just say there could be a lot going on behind the scenes. I don't know about, and I will qualify everything that I've said with stating that, that fact that there could be a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't know about and that I don't know about. But if you're looking at it objectively from a fan perspective, you're wondering how in the world is the ACC getting trashed every night when the Big Ten was a flaming pile of garbage in the the NCAA tournament? And, whoa, Miami was great. Yeah. Right. Where are the people? It's purely, it's purely monetary. That, right. That, and monetary but, has led into people thinking that money equals wins and losses and success in on the actual field court, whatever we're talking about. And that's just mo- money has a high correlation with success, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's success. But where are the people pumping us up and talking about how great we are and not and also calling out the Big Ten hype machine for the fraud that it is. Because nobody has like the ACC passion or not a lot of people have the ACC passion that like the like people will only chant ACC, ACC, like as a response to the SEC. They won't do it on their own. Like you have SEC schools who will chant their conference instead of their team when they win a bowl game. And that that's just crazy to me. But they just have that pride and I don't know where it comes from. It doesn't make sense to me, but the ACC just doesn't have that. And that's what makes me pessimistic about the future. And that's a problem. And I think Joe obvious was right about this when he came on is he said the ACC network doesn't get the conference, the fans, we as fans in the ACC like hating on our rivals. We don't like rooting for them. Like, let me tell you something. That's true. If if North Carolina is playing in any championship, I will root against them. I will. Doesn't matter what it is. Okay. If, uh, and generally, you know, there's some other teams I wouldn't care about to root one way or another, but I, I, I wouldn't get invested in rooting in for, for example, although I like NC state and I hope they do well, uh, because, uh, my cousin's going there, you know, I'd like for her to see, to experience a great football team while she's there, but you know, I'm not, I'm not such a fan that I'm going to chant ACC, ACC, because I think, I think Joe was right. We enjoy being petty towards the other members of our conference and especially Syracuse. I'm never going to root for Syracuse ever. It's just not going to happen. BC. I don't care. I don't care yeah. about the Eagles. Like, yeah, I'm not. I'm not turning on like maybe I used to when I had the account, but I'm not turning on like BC women's lacrosse finals games because like it's good for the conference to win championships. Like, I don't well, care. Okay, let, let me Notre Dame, especially now that Mike Bray's not there. That's really the only reason I liked Notre Dame men's basketball. Yeah, because of his Duke ties. I don't care who's there. I, I'm not going to root for them and I don't care. And they should, they should, uh, we should embrace that as a conference level, as a marketing thing. And, you know, it, it, yeah, I think that would be great on the ACC network to see us get petty and passive aggressive towards each other and all that stuff. But I'm trying to make us something we're not. 
Exactly. And I think that Jim Phillips, though, needs to do something. I, and he could be doing a lot behind the scene. I will qualify everything I'm saying with saying by, by admitting there could be a lot that's going on behind the scene. But it's it's created an impression that there's a vacuum of leadership at the conference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's I, I'm not a fan. Like I preface this segment by saying I'm not a fan of the leadership. And I don't think that's going to be the reason that the conference collapses if it does, but it might be the reason. I don't know. It, it's definitely not helping is what I'm saying. I think, I think that, that you're a hundred percent correct on that. So let's two other things I want to ask you about, tell us where we can follow you on, on social media. Where can we catch up with Dan? Tell us what Dan's up, where, where Dan is, what accounts he's got. Yeah. So just my personal account, Dan Siegel underscore Siegel spelled S I E G E L. You could find me there. I basically tweet about everything like UVA, ACC. I'm a UMass student. So I tweet about our pathetic athletic department and how I really wish that wasn't the case and reminisce or I guess not reminisce. I wasn't a student then. I wasn't alive then, but the nineties when things were better and how, so I, I, I talk about all sorts of things there. You could also find me and my content over at college basketball review. We are a website, cbbreview.com and also the CBB review YouTube channel. You could find our podcasts there. And I know most of the listeners here are Duke people. So probably not as interested in this, but I do also, I'm also a contributor for Streaking the Lawn. You can find them on Twitter at STL underscore UVA. All right. Now you have been, uh, and I did check this. I confirmed I was correct. You do have a Duke tie at UMass in Ben Albert, former defensive line and co-defensive coordinator for the Blue Devils. He was there for quite a long time. Yeah, yeah, great great guy. He was there for a long He's time. He's awesome. I, I really like him. I think he runs our special teams, which was very bad last year, but he he's a great dude and a good ambassador to the program. You've got him. That's his second stint there, and you are correct. Uh, he is the assistant head coach, special teams coach, and defensive line coach. Yeah. And I will, I will say, because, uh, well – one of the things that I like doing, although I'm doing this less, uh, interviewing players, I'm going to try to get some former players on again in the off season because they will be a lot more open than the current players can be, and there's reasons for that, and I'm not knocking any of the, of the current players for, for that. It's just the reality. But I'll, I have heard a, a complaint that Albert should never have been made co-defensive coordinator because he's such a good defensive line coach. You mm. want him focused on that defensive line. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we've been getting like our conference transfers on the defensive line, probably because of him, like uh, Chambre Jackson from Florida state, Marcus Bradley from uh, Vanderbilt. So he, he has put a lot of guys in the NFL when he was at Boston college, he had a really good defensive yeah. line. This is his third stint at UMass. He knows what he's doing, and he is a very, very good coach. Yes. So you guys are lucky to have him. Now, you have answered a lot of questions that I have asked you, and so it is only fair because you are a guest here to give you an open mic to talk about anything that you would like Uh to talk about. So the floor is yours. I was going to get into the conference realignment stuff, but we already touched on that, so – Hmm. That's well, t- you can talk about anything that you want. I am almost okay. done finally with Andor because I watched it without my kids present. And man, is that show great. And I had a long debate uh, with a guest recently about various portions of the Star Wars universe. So, you know what, man, you fire away whatever okay. you want to get into. Here's what I'll say because we started talking about it and – The UMass football program, right, everybody in the country loves to just laugh at us, and rightfully so because the program has been awful the entire FBS existence that they've had. But I just wanted to give some spotlight into 
what's going on behind the scenes, why things might change. And I know our expectation, things changing, like our Super Bowl would be going to a, a bowl and going six and six. But just I, I want I want to shine some light on it. You don't have to believe it unless it actually happens. But Don Brown, who is formerly formerly defensive coordinator at a number of schools, including Michigan, is really helping out this program, building it up from the ground. And it's very much an us against the world mentality this year because everybody has UMass at number 131 out of 131 in the FBS. And that's what it is every year. And they only prove that to be true. But defense was actually one of the top half defenses in the country last year in terms of the advanced analytics and the efficiency metrics. And the offense has brought in a couple quarterbacks, which is really the problem. So um, I'm excited. The quarterback being Tyson Pumachon, I think, will start. He was at Georgia Tech and Clemson. So we are going to root for UMass primarily because it is also the it's name. It's still the sicko move. Right. That's football. It's also, if I remember correctly, the name of a Pixies song. Yes, it is. So uh, that is a band that I enjoy quite a bit. We will root for them. And in the interim, we are lining up a few more guests to close out the season. Okay, we've we've previewed – the old Atlantic. So we got to preview the old coastal and then we've got to do, hopefully we'll be able to do a season preview for the blue devils. I don't know if that's going to happen. I'm trying to line up a few things. My August is looking a little hectic, so we will see, but in the interim, you can keep up with us by sending us an email at bull city coordinators at gmail.com. Go to our Twitter account, go to our website, bullcitycoordinators.com, And Hit us up on any of the social medias. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. Keep listening, and we will keep scheduling interviews. And as always, go Duke.